This year's theme has been such an exciting thing for me, the word higher. I, I love the premise of going higher, but I know it's hard because the, the process of moving higher is never all the way too fun. When you go higher, you go against gravity. <laughs> you go against what is not always comfortable to go against. And you find yourself where your body is sore, your legs are tired, your lungs are get heavier because the, the, the breathe, the breath changes. as the level changes. So this whole year, we went through all the process so far of the different angles of going higher. And today, I figured, let's enter into the direction of today or the topic for myself today will be on resurrection. And this, this topic usually is sort of speaking about only on Easter. But I figured why not spend a whole day, a whole sermon today on the word resurrection, which is the picture of something being lower and raised up to a higher place. So whatever is buried, when it raises, is greater than when the first was buried. Keep that in mind. Whatever is raised is greater than whatever it was when it was first buried. So today, we'll take a look at the word resurrection, and I have a few angles on this word that hopefully, hopefully we'll open our minds up today to see the Bible differently, see yourself differently, and even see God differently. Because God put it to a place where the word resurrection has been like a center place of salvation for us, hasn't it? It's like center on, on our belief structure, being that if you don't believe that Jesus Christ is from the dead, that you're not really going to be <laughs> assessed or be able to enter into this kingdom because you don't believe that portion of his life. Why? Because we are a resurrected people, and we are found in him. So if we are found in him, and we live in him, since he's resurrected, we too are resurrected. But resurrection takes place bodily, takes place spiritually, takes place in our minds. It has different angles of where you can be resurrected if you're alive to, to do that for you today. So, as I speak today, right, begin to imagine for yourself, are the places in my life that I need to be resurrected in? Are the places in my life where I need to allow God to bury something and raise something else in my life? Because we all have it. It's some way, some, some place, somewhere in yourself where you know, if I just put this down to rest, when he raises it, it will be a lot better than what I see right now. But the process of laying it down is just so hard. You want to hold on to it. You want to keep it. And God is saying, the only way you go find your life, right, is if you lay it down. Isn't it? That's the only way you find your life. The only way. The only way you find your life is that you lay it down. But that process is hurtful. It's not comfortable. If it feels feel like you, you, you lost a piece of yourself. But God is saying, if you let this go, what I have for you is so much greater. So much greater. <clears throat> so Paul, speaking <clears throat> in the book of Hebrews, had a few statements that really um, shook my foundation when I first read these texts. It's found in Hebrews verse, chapter 5, and we'll take a look at verse 12 real quick. So Hebrews 5, verse 12. If you turn there, that's what it says. It says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's, for he's still a baby. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have used have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Going to chapter 6 real quick. Chapter 6, 1 and 2 says this. Therefore, leaving discussions of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. He says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of doctrines of baptisms, of laying of hands, of resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. So Paul describes these things, and he says that these things are basic. He said, let us not lay again these simple things, which means this audience should have had a grasp of these things already, but they didn't. 
because they were still eating baby food, not solid food. Now you hear in the church a lot, whenever you begin to talk like this, they say, here we go again, something else, more than the norm. <laughs> Which is not a bad thing because when you hear new things, you get to at least stretch your mind and your spirit when something new hits you. So today's hope is that what is said today will cause you to think, will cause you to research, will cause you to go home and read again what you already know, but to ask God for more if you lie yourself. So today is that challenge for you today, and as we go on, I hope that it really draws you to a place where you cannot wait to enter this book the next time and read something else that's new to you. But it says, the resurrection of the dead. And this word resurrection, we know in a sense that when we think about the word resurrection, we think about one thing, which is Christ's body, which is correct. But it's a vast host of things that deal with a particular topic. And if we miss everything, we miss the basic principle of what God was showing to us that was encapsulated in Christ at the cross. <clears throat> so some years ago, some guys decided they want to debunk the theory of resurrection. So they began playing with things in their minds, and the thing came up, a theory came up, called the swoon theory. Ever heard of it? This theory, in definition, is <clears throat> a partial or total loss of consciousness, a state of suspended animation. Basically, the whole thought was this, that Christ did not die at the cross. He supposedly just passed out. And when he passed out, he was put in the tomb, and on the third day, his spirit went back to his body, and he rose up. Because the Jews believed that three days after you die, your spirit hovers around you. And at that point, at any point in moment in time, thank you, at any point in moment in time, your spirit can return back into your body, and you will be all right. <laughs> You'll be awake, and death is no more, and that's it. So let's figure, let's run with this theme for a little bit, see what happens. And they began preaching this stuff. Some who didn't know better or didn't have any understanding believed it. Because it makes sense. How can you die and raise? It sounds so out of our comprehension, doesn't it? But now, on that theory, let's just go through right now and let's just destroy that whole premise. If anybody even had a hint of thought that could be real in the room, let's destroy it right now. So the process was this. Jesus was put on the cross. He was nailed, right, in both hands and feet. And while at the cross, <coughs> the, the um, centurions went to him, and when they saw that he was dead, Bible tells us, they took his spear and they stabbed him on the side. No leg was broken, because to break the legs is to say that you're not dead yet, let's hurry the process up. So we break your leg, and now your lungs collapse, which causes you to die a lot faster. So Jesus didn't have to go through that because he was already dead. But if, say, he wasn't dead, he gets stabbed in the side, blood and water comes out, he's wrapped and put in the tomb, and on the third day, let's say he wakes up, right? So he's up now. He has holes in his feet, holes in his hands, holes in his side, and he must somehow figure out how I'm going to open this tomb by turning over this 2,000-pound boulder that is blocking the tomb, right? After this process... I'm going to now fight off the armed guards that were there. I thought he gets past this, right? He will now go a few miles, about seven miles or so, on his way to Jerusalem, and on that way, he will meet two disciples, and he will talk to them about the Bible, they invite them to their house, and while he's there, he will share the word with them, the eyes will be opened up, and he'll go to Jerusalem and knock on the door, right? And as the disciples are in the door, he appears, in front of them. Let's say that it happen. If they saw this man bloodied up, hair messed up, drenched, filthy, barely can walk, how would this convince them that this is the risen Christ? How would this convince them that this is anybody of significance? I tell you, if you find me a man who went through all that stuff and live, I'll follow him. Won't you? Find me a man <laughs> that go through all that process and can stand tall at any moment. That man is worth following. He really is. 
My resurrection was not only found in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, a few places show resurrection. One of them is the Shunammite woman. She had a son, an only son, and he died. And she called Elijah to come to help save her son. And when he came, took the boy, laid him on the bed, and he put his mouth to the kid's mouth, his hands to the kid's hands, and he stretched the kid out. What was that picture? And the kid came to life. The only son. So from the beginning, God has shown us pictures pointing, pointing to this man. And we will see later on. Another time where a dead man's body was thrown in the tomb of Elijah, and when he touched Elijah's bones, he woke up. <laughs> this is Old Testament. Old Testament. So Christ had it all put together, how the whole principle of, of resurrection will be showing itself through all of the Bible, piece by piece, piece by piece. But if we look for it, we'll find it. If we don't, then we miss it, of course. <clears throat> I found three areas of resurrection. What this means is, I found only three. It may be more, maybe thousands. I found only three areas I could point out today of resurrection being explained or shown through the Bible. One of that area is, excuse me, is the Jesus body. Went through right now, right? So that's clear. The next section of that is sowing the seed. The other section will be the area of talking about how Adam came to be. These are three basic sections on how you can see the resurrection process being displayed through the Bible. We just spoke a little bit about Jesus and how he was raised on the third day. If you remember, when he was raised, this body of his was able to eat fish, eat bread, but yet go through doors. So he could disappear and appear as he chooses. So was this body the same body as before? Of course not. This body was a lot greater than what was. So in resurrection, whatever is buried and what is raised are similar in the sense that you can recognize it, but they are very different in quality. So Christ's body will be a picture of our own body in the future. Remember when Lazarus died? And they sent for Jesus. Jesus took four days before he got there. And while he was on his way, Martha heard that he was close. And she ran to Jesus, met him halfway. And she said to him, if you were here, my brother would have lived. And he said, your brother will live. And she, No, I'm sorry, he said your brother will rise. That's what he said. And she said, yeah, I know. In the last day he will rise. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he may live. And those who live in me and believe in me shall never die. Never die. And he asked that one question, do you believe this? What is he saying? He took it himself the completeness of resurrection, and say, it is me. So you have saw, through whatever you have saw it as, I'm telling you today, Martha, resurrection is me. And if anybody lives inside of me, lives in me, there too, I resurrect the people. And did she get it then? I'm not quite sure. She got it right at that point. Not quite sure. But on the next side, the smaller side, <coughs> excuse me, There we go. On the next side now of um, sowing the seed, which is the area where, if you could view it, you realize that when God, first of all, when Jesus was in the, the grave, it was three days. Then he woke up, correct? He resurrected. But now, if you take a seed and you plant it in the ground, about the third day or so, the casing cracks. And the seed begins to grow. The third day. That's significant. I'm guessing so. In the Bible, Genesis 1. In Genesis 1. If you turn real quick, if you can. Real quick. It says this. Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. This is creation now. 
Genesis 1 verse 11. And it's real simple and to the point. It says, then God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb that yield seeds and the fruit trees that yield fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on, on the earth and it was so. So basically what God did was in every plant that he planted, there was, there was the fruit and a seed. So if I took an apple seed and I planted it in the ground, what comes up? An apple tree. Not a seed, right? What will happen if I plant a seed and the seed comes out? That would be a problem. That would be a real big problem because when you plant a seed, what comes out is the tree, and from the tree comes the fruit, and eventually that same seed will be found again in that fruit. So it's a process that got put together. So the seed takes three days to crack. After that, the process begins. So resurrection was put together even in the natural plant life. The plant kingdom got put resurrection together because due to the fact of how seeds come to life in the whole world today, billions of people right now eat food from the same process, don't they? Every plant, every grain we eat, what the process is the same process that we all eat food today from by the principle of resurrection. Got put together in the place where if you show in the natural, it's pointing something else. And he was pointed. And from Genesis on, we had to point at the Christ that was to come. And he pointed. <clears throat> so the apple seed goes to the apple tree, back to the apple, and back. <clears throat> Mess that up. It's okay. We know the point. We messed that up. <laughs> I was written wrong. <laughs> I wasn't the point there. <laughs> it's the seed to the tree to the apple back to the seed. We know what's going on, right? We follow? Okay, we good. We good. <clears throat> so, <laughs> in the category of sowing the seed, there's three sections in this alone. First one was the plant kingdom, which you just explained. The second one now is preaching of the word. <clears throat> Look at the text real quick in Matthew 17, which is the story of the um, parable of the sower. Matthew 13. This is the principle of resurrection that we never considered before, but I hope you see it today. <clears throat> and on this... Before we actually get to the actual reading, I have some key words to go over with you. If you will visualize or change the word sower to preacher, change the word seed to word, change the word good ground to believers, and change the word, it's supposed to be crop, <laughs> to, good, to fruit life. <laughs> if you change those words as we read, you see how the whole thing begins to make sense now. So in Matthew 13, <clears throat> verse 3, this is what it says. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower, but let's call it a preacher, went to sow. And as he preached, some <clears throat> word fell on wayside, and the birds came to devour them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth on the earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them, but others fell on good ground. The good ground is believers, and they yield crops. The crop right there is the fruitful life. Some a hundredfold, some sixty folds. It continues. The disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? Which would state that usually when you talk to them, he talks to them plainly. But to the masses, it's in parables. Continue. Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Let's pause real quick. 
So it's not being said right here. To you, the ministry was given to you. But to them, it wasn't. What was that about? What was that about? These are his sons, his body on earth. And to them, the mysteries of heaven has been given to them. So you find that in an average church, some will tell you that you will not know this. No, this is this too much. You will find this out when you die. That's what they will tell you. When you're in heaven, you find this out. But God is saying the mysteries of heaven has been given to you. So you have a chance today on earth to know some of these things. And what happens is we are satisfied by walking by and seeing the gold nugget, grabbing it, and keep walking. And God is saying, if you find a gold nugget at this spot, maybe if you dig right here and keep digging, there will be a gold mine under you. So it's our choice. It's our choice. God wants to reveal himself to us. He doesn't have to hide himself from us. He wants, to be, he wants to be seen. So if you choose, or if you're eager enough, or hungry enough, to want to dig, I guarantee you will find things that the rest will not find. Every single time. Because the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven is here for us now. Not when you die. Now. Continue what says in verse 12. <clears throat> for whoever has, to him more will be given. And he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see. And hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. <clears throat> and in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear, you will hear, and shall not understand. And seeing you will see, not perceive, <clears throat> nor the hearts of these people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes, and their eyes, they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn, <clears throat> so that I should heal them. Verse 16. But blessed are your eyes, for they do see, and your ears, for they do hear. For I shall I say to you, that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see, and did not see it. And to hear what you hear and did not hear it. In the Bible, we know of a few wise men in the Bible. And one of them that could come up right off your mind may be Paul. The man that could reveal secrets in the kingdom of God. If I tell you today that it's possible for you to know more today than Paul did, that wrote a piece of the Bible, will you believe it? Today, it's possible, if you are hungry enough, if you are humble enough to seek him hard enough, because if you don't ask, you don't receive, right? If you don't seek, you won't find, right? If you don't knock, the door will be open, right? If you care enough to want to enter in, go somewhere deeper, you will know more today than Paul did. You understand more today than these men who wrote this book knows because the same God, as one of them, says that we will do greater things. Whether that's in deed or understanding or knowledge, it's all in the same package. But the key is how much do you want it? That's the key. So in the area of the sower, we see that as the preacher sows the seed, some may fall on not so good places, but the word that falls on the good ground, that ground, you know why it's good? That ground has been toiled, it's, it's, it's been watered, it is ready to receive. It says in Isaiah 58 that we are a well watered garden. That ground is good ground, could receive seed, and the seed will have room to grow. At that point, you will be fruitful. That will produce more fruit as you go. That's who we are. The process of a seed going in the ground and dying and rising from the ground is the same process of resurrection that Christ came to show us.
but was already established from the beginning. And God used analogy all through scripture. In parables, agricultural, he used it everywhere to point at the picture of what happened now, have been happening all along, piece by piece, it's been happening. Another section of sowing a seed, and we all hear, and if you watch TV long enough, you will hear this phrase in some late show one day say, sow a seed and you receive blah, 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 blah. <laughs> And the whole point is, if you give money to God, you will get more money. That sounds good, right? Like investment. You know, I invest a little bit here, and I wait, and more comes out later on. It sounds good. But just like the seed, what will happen if you plant a seed and get back a seed? If you give money and you get back only money, God robbed you. If you get back only money, if your expectation is to receive back only money, you have the wrong view. So let's take a look real quick at the story in Genesis 14. And let's see if we can explain this whole myth real quick. <clears throat> now, in the Bible, you know that it's a few things that God has used or shown us that is for us to celebrate certain things of our faith. One is baptism, right? It's pretty much the picture of the old person dying and the new man raising up. Another one is the Lord's Supper, right? The picture of when one day we all, as the whole bride, will have a banqueted feast one day with our, our groom, the maker. Go through all this process. Some things that just have all these meanings that we all celebrate time for time. Then is one of them, which is called tithing. That we don't really have an idea of what we are celebrating, right? It seems as if you do this, you get this, and that's it. It's done. But what is the point, actually, of sowing this particular seed? What are you celebrating? We'll get to that. Let's read Genesis 13, 14, I'm sorry, verses 18 to 20. It's two verses. This is a story now of Abraham, his, <clears throat> his, um, his, I'm sorry, his cousin, Lot, nephew, nephew, Lot, I'm sorry, however, has now been taken away by captive. And he went and he fought all. First of all, he went with 318 men and he fought four kings. 318 men. And he fought four kings and their army, and he won. And he took back part of his inheritance, which he gave to Lot. On his way back, he meets this man. This is where it takes off right here. In verse 18, it continues. He meets him, 18 says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And he gave him a tithe of all. Now, I don't get this. So I went, and I, I go off to war, and I retrieve what is mine, and I come, I see this king, and he decides to bless me with bread and wine, and I give him a tenth? How make more sense? What is being said here? Let's break it down. <clears throat> Melchizedek is two words put together. The first one, Melchi, means king. Zedek means righteousness. Salem means peace. When you see tithe, that's a tenth, of course. And when you see bread, I want you to see the word. Whenever you see bread in the Bible, just switch it with words, see what happens. Because it was a man that was known to be the word from the beginning, and he said, I am the bread of life, come down from heaven. Remember that guy? There's another one where it says wine. If you don't see wine as spirit, you miss the whole point. Because it says, do not be drunk with wine, but be drunk by the spirit. So when we switch it over, now let's read it again. Let's see what pops up. It says... 
now Melchizedek, a king of righteousness, <clears throat> king of Salem, so he's a king of righteousness that rules over a place of peace, right? And he brought out bread and wine. He brought out word and spirit to a man, Abram. I thought he blessed them. Abram gives him a tithe. What is this picture? The kingdom of God is made of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, right? So is a man that represents a picture of somebody, which is Jesus Christ that we know already. And this king, the king of righteousness, and when he comes to you and he gives you word and he gives you his spirit and you are fed, he makes you his son. And at that point, you choose to give him a tenth as a celebration of your sonship. Not because you have to. Not because he begs you. You decide. Abraham decided. He didn't ask Abraham to give anything. Abraham said, I have received from your hands. So now I give back to you. To celebrate that, I am your son. You are the king of kings, king of righteous. You rule and bring peace on my behalf. And I, as a son, will give to you a tenth. When you give a tenth, what has happened exactly? Because as human beings, we have a tendency to want to hoard, right? Keep to ourselves. When you give, what are you doing? You release and it enlarges, enhances your faith. Because if you give money and get back money, you've been robbed. So whatever you get back has to be a lot more than money. So what do you receive? You receive, you receive now how to trust. You receive now that you, you already have the knowledge of who he is and you are his son. You are no more a beggar. You have to give. Then there's offerings on top of that. When you give offerings, God is allowing you to now experience what he feels when he gives. He has nothing back when he gives. So when you decide to give some money to somebody, how do you feel exactly? Isn't there some kind of weird chemical thing that happens inside of you? You can't even explain how excited you are to see them receive it with joy? He's allowing you to feel the way he feels when he gave his only son. He gave willingly. And at that point, we cannot come to him, right? Because the son of resurrection that we not live in, we become part of his body. Part of his body. And at that point now, we have no more need to think or imagine that if I give $10, I expect back 20 That's it. That can't be it. It cannot be it. It's a lot more here that we can receive. And God is saying that if you just trust Believe in me. Find yourself in me. Live in me. I will show you everything that you need and believe you are son. You are not sinners saved by grace. You are sons. So a son willingly celebrates that by giving. So if you ever felt uncomfortable, felt pressured, felt like you had to, today let's take it out of our heads. Delete it, let it go. You only give for that reason, that you are his son. If you believe you're his son, then you give. If you don't, you're afraid, you hide, you hoard. That's what orphans do. They don't have inheritance. Their only source, source is what they could do. But his son has the father. He has the father. And whatever he will receive comes from his father's hands, not his own. <clears throat> Where am I? I forgot myself. <clears throat> okay. So, we, the first three things were we talking about uh, Jesus' body, then now sowing the seed. Last part is Adam. Adam is a very complex but yet simple thing. When God created Adam, you know what he did? God sowed a seed from heaven into the ground. And he rose up a son. It was that simple. Resurrection. 
The first son that he would put on earth, the first king he would put on earth was brought here in the same picture of resurrection. Resurrection. Now, where did Adam come from? I mean, we, we can't understand. He, you know, got breathed into the dirt. You know, that's what happened. He woke up. But have we even took time to really exhibit and just go through the stuff? See what's going on here? Where was Adam? Where was Adam? Was he the dirt? Was he the spirit? Was he... Like, where's Adam? What is he? See, years ago, right? One of my first, first sermons here, Pastor, I remember this so clearly. I was preaching, right? And that's, that's when I first read that verse in this time, which is um, <clears throat> Jeremiah 1.5, right? Before, you, before your mother's womb, he knew you, right? He set you apart to be a prophet to nations, blah, 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 blah. And my young mind took it as, oh, that's simple. We were with him in heaven. <laughs> that's how I took it. So I preached that. <laughs> and somebody at the end asked a question. Oh, I didn't know, you know, that we were in heaven before. And I was like, yeah, you know, like, so, like, that's what it was, you know. <laughs> Pastor, tried to help me clean it up, you know. <laughs> he tried. That's what I believed in. But then about three, four years ago, I'm reading the text again, Genesis 1, studying this text. And it came to me. If Adam is the spirit, where did he come from? How will God know you before you're your mother's womb if you were not found in him? Because in the body of Christ, we return back to him, correct? So everybody was found in Christ, in the Father, before you were breathed into the ground that was molded for you to rise. So that's what happened when, when you begin to think, when you hear certain things, you never, you never, you never understood it before. And it makes sense all of a sudden. You know why? Your connection with the Father has been made clearer. The lines become clearer now. You can see a little closer. Because you always knew this stuff, but your mind did it. But your spirit knew it. But your mind is all new to you. But you were always in him. And when God said, Adam, Rise, got himself, so the seed out of himself into dirt, and he rose him up, and Adam stood. Adam stood. And at that point now, you could never refer to yourself again, my first statement, as sinner, because from the beginning, you were son. From the beginning, you came out of him. And if you see yourself as that, if you believe that you are a son, you believe that you come from him, how can you even think of looking at yourself any less? Why would you believe somebody else's lie about you? They tell you you are nothing, you're not good enough, blah, blah, blah. If you really know that you are a son. And our job here is very simple. We are here to basically represent him on earth. Be that picture on earth. You want to be seen. So we get now to be that same light, to be that same image of his spirit to the world that we see. So when the world see, not just one of us, but the whole body of Christ that will see again the son that was created through the process of resurrection. And when the world sees that son, they will say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord's house, to the house of Jacob. Let us learn their ways. Let us learn from them. Have them teach us. How is it possible that they have it to- together? How is it possible? The whole world's falling apart, but they are, they are found themselves. Everybody's excited about something. They're always happy. Everybody have enough. No one have more than another. Everybody shares the world will be confused to see it. people that believe in something that draw them together where there's no quarrel. There's no strife. Because this son, this perfect son, this image of Christ is not expressed through the whole body. See, one person cannot express that, one person. 
We see a little glimpse of that, but the whole body gets the perfect chance to express that to the world. When it's all said and done, they will see us and they will be jealous. But the unfortunate part is, as of right now, the world are really jealous of the church. Because our view, for, our view of ourselves is still very different than what he sees. So in time, we'll get there. But God tells us that the bride will make herself ready. The bride will. So in time, we'll figure it out. In time, we'll iron out all the cranks. You know, we'll let go of all the bickering and all the nice. We'll let it go in time. But just to show a picture of where we are right now, where we can be, it forces us more to be intentional on your own personal life and the personal and your own body life in order to move higher. Because if you don't go higher, the process takes a lot longer than what it can be. So before I continue to rumble on, let's stand and I'll pray. <clears throat> Not bad, Pastor Aaron. 36 minutes. There we go. Not bad. <laughs> Father God, thank you. <clears throat> Thank for your word, Father God. Thank you for challenging us. Thank you for revealing to us, Father God, that you are our God. And we are your sons. And whenever <clears throat> we allow ourselves to be able to see what you see, Father God, our life will change. We will be able to um, <clears throat> be able to represent you here on earth, Father God. Be able to show the world, Lord, how our life represents what you live, Father. And the world will see us and they will praise you who are in heaven. So, Lord God, watch over us today, Father. Make us hungry for, for the, your word, and we will not be satisfied wherever we are right now, Jesus. We will want more and more from you <clears throat> every single day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat>